Okay, good. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Joint MDB's pavilion and also to our event on building capacity for transition towards low emissions and uh, uh, climate resilient development pathways. This event is co-hosted by the uh, IFS and the New Development Bank. And thanks very much to the Joint MDB's pavilion and also the uh, New Development Bank for hosting this event. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, I'm Chen Lin from the in Beijing-based Institute of Finance and Sustainability. And uh, the topic, as I actually introduced, is about capacity building on sustainable finance and also for decarbonization and tra uh, tra transition decarbonization pathways. Um, actually, there is a very strong background on this. So in the past few years, green finance has been growing very fast, which has been largely used to um, support the green economy and low carbon and even transitional activities in the past. And if we count our numbers, the market is growing more than four tenfolds in majority of the uh, financial markets in the world, including in China, OECD countries, and also other developing countries like the India, like Southeast Asia, and so on. But apparently, there's still a very big gap. So in China alone, the green uh, loans market is st standing at around like 28 trillion RMB, but it's only accounting for 12% of the total um, uh, banking sector's asset. And uh, <clears throat> the ratio for the bond market and other capital markets are even lower. So considering that means we need to take more actions. We need to green more uh, financial assets um, in the next uh, de a few decades before we can realize carbon neutrality. And we can also say uh, more than uh, close to 90% of more than 88% of the banking assets are brown, but at least half of them actually are transitional. So we need to transition those activities into low carbon and maybe net zero before 2060 in China's case, and in other countries' case, maybe 2050, and maybe 2070 in India's case, and maybe uh, for South Asia countries, 2060 as well. And that is one thing. And another thing is, <clears throat> for transition alone, transition finance alone, um, actually there are a lot of challenges and barriers. Just like the G20 transition finance framework developed and endorsed uh, by the G20 leaders in 2022, we realize in order to help or facilitate the investors and capital markets into a pathway for transition finance, a lot of things is needed. And in the transition finance framework, there are five major things that need to be done including to identify the transitional activities, to disclose properly about the transition uh, status and also progress made, and also about the products innovation, as well as the incentives and just transition elements. So there are a lot of things that needs to be done. And apparently in the most recent G20 report developed this year, under the India's G20 presidency, we have developed a TAAP, which is abbreviation of, te of Technical Assistance Action Plan for um, sustainable finance. And we identified also quite a lot of actions that can be taken by various uh, stakeholders. So I was also speaking to a lot of colleagues. <clears throat> if by 2030, which is very critical to all economies in the world, we are still, still focusing on green finance, we are doomed. And if we're we not talking about the green finance anymore, we're also doomed. So we need to do something to help at least uh, mobilize the public participation and also understanding of the um, green and the transition finance. And with that in mind today, we are very happy to have very good lineup of speakers for both the welcome, keynote, and also panel discussion. And uh, <clears throat> without ado, let me uh, try to turn to the first session of today. But before doing that, uh, one or two um, more like a, a rules, housekeeping rules to announce. So firstly, for those who are very um, <clears throat> uh, interestingly or are very um, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> has been attracted to our events in person to this pavilion, please turn your mobile devices into a manners mode. And for those online um, participation, especially I think we have live streaming through YouTube. So if you are watching on YouTube, if you do have questions, you can leave something there. And I think we'll try our best to answer that. And uh, for the in-person participants, we will probably uh, leave maybe a few minutes for the Q&A in the end. So without further ado, let me invite our first speaker today, um, who is uh, Mr. Anu, um, <clears throat> Mr. Anil uh, Kishora, who is the Vice President and Chief Re Risk Officer from the New Development Bank. Um, Mr. Anil, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Honorable uh, Minister Sergio from Bolivia, 
uh, former minister and executive vice president of uh, Fon Plata, Ms. Mariana Prado, Dr. Majun, uh, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here today to welcome you all to the event. First, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our co-host, the Institute of Finance and Sustainability for their dedicated efforts. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to all the distinguished speakers. Thank you very much for making time to participate in this event and share your valuable insights. This is the second time I represent the New Development Bank at COP. Each year, the conference takes place not only in a different country, but in different contexts. As we speak, the world is experiencing ongoing geopolitical challenges, and many people are struggling with their livelihoods. Governments are concerned about how best to deploy their limited resources among competing socioeconomic and, and, and environmental priorities without imposing additional debt. The good news is that climate finance is on the rise. According to the Climate Policy Initiative, average annual climate finance flows reached USD 1.3 trillion in 2021-2022, nearly doubling compared to 1920 levels. Nevertheless, flows continued to fall short of needs, particularly in developing and low-income economies. The COP20 presidency has recognized this development and rightly highlighted a range of thematic areas where they would like to deliver ambitious yet pragmatic solutions. These include further advocacy for a just energy transition, emphasis on a scaling of climate finance, as well as a call for a holistic approach, seeking to identify climate solutions that look after ecosystems, biodiversity, natural capital stock, and the health of people. All of these are crucial facets to address and enable low emission and climate resilient transitions. However, to what extent such actions can be adopted and operationalized depends largely on whether capacity is in place to make things happen on the ground. This is why today's discussions are more than pertinent. To achieve Paris Agreement goals requires effective means of implementation. As outlined in the Paris Agreement Article 11, capacity building under this agreement should enhance the capacity and ability of developing country parties to implement adaptation and mitigation actions and should facilitate technology development dissemination and deployment, access to climate, uh, climate finance, relevant aspects of education, training and public awareness, and transparent, timely, and accurate communication of information. My interpretation of the article leads me to highlight three aspects. First, capacity building needs to cultivate the right mindset. This means more educational efforts could be devoted to help better understand climate risks, their impacts, and how to manage them. Financial institutions, for instance, may want to avoid investing in potentially stranded assets in case of perceived climate risk. Farmers, let's say, may be more willing to adopt insurance as a mechanism to safeguard their livelihoods if their crops are, were likely to be damaged by more frequent droughts. It would be in the very interest of the private sector to act if their supply chains were to be disrupted by anticipated climate change. In doing so, it would be easier to convince the stakeholders of taking actions today rather than tomorrow. Second, capacity building needs to put in place the right institutional process. To bring sustainable finance to a scale, for instance, Credible financing frameworks need to be established to guide fundraising activities. This is what the G20 has promoted. In 2020, the G20 Transition Finance Framework was endorsed by the G20 leaders in Indonesia, setting out 22 high-level principles 
to guide policy formulation on this front. This year, under the Indian presidency, a step further was taken to endorse the G20 Technical Assistance Action Plan, calling for tailored capacity building services in important topics such as transition finance. Recommendations from the Independent Experts Group uh, set up under the Indian G G20 presidency, as well as the ca capital adequacy framework recommendations finalized under the previous presidencies, moreover, are focused on ramping up the capacity of multilateral banking systems and make them better, bolder, and bigger for contributing effectively to sustainability, climate, and growth aspirations. Third and finally, capacity building needs to nurture the right skill sets. As more green technology becomes accessible, more talents will be in demand in a step with the technological upgrades. An energy system established on rene renewable energy may rely on fundamentally different knowledge, technical, and managerial systems from those based on traditional energy sources. This entails constant learning and also implies the need for professional training as an indispensable part of a just energy transition. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as I always say, in an uncertain world full of unexpected twists and turns, we need to augment our adaptive capacity in a broader sense. This entails accumulation of all sorts of capital that help anticipate and withstand impacts induced by changes. NDB is a cooperation platform of countries that share an unwavering commitment to climate and environmental agenda. The bank is committed to helping its member states achieve their SDGs and to fulfill their commitments under the, under the Paris Agreement. We support the strategies of our member countries to reduce greenhouse emissions, to finance renewable energy, green and resilient infrastructure, and to move towards low emission growth. At NDB, we stand ready to work with all stakeholders to build the capacity for this ever-changing world. We are also ready to leverage our convening capacities and act as the conduit to facilitate the exchange of technology, knowledge, and practices. Every time an energy transition happened in the past, historically, the global economy benefited and acquired huge tailwind. This time should not be different. Let's build capacity to achieve our global sustainability and climate goals and position the economy to seize the upcoming new opportunities. Uh, I'm really delighted that we have an excellent panel today and uh, with the support of Dr. Majun, and we have representatives from the industry as well uh, who actually have to uh, bring it to the ground. So we have uh, Mr. Arya, uh, who is leading in the uh, renewable EV space, and we have uh, Mr. Maher uh, here. Uh, so I look forward to listening to the panel discussions. Thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you very much, Mr. Neil. I totally agree with you, uh, the need for uh, building capacity, and also that we need to take timely action. We need to um, put play in place the right institutions, and also we need to do the right uh, skilling sets uh, for those people who are in need. Um, <clears throat> so as um, I think we'll uh, be very soon hear from Dr. Ma that actually we are going to launch a CASI later uh, this week, and uh, uh, CASI is uh, in the right place to address uh, some of the most important challenges. So without further ado, now let me invite Dr. Ma, who is the president of the Institute of Finance and Stability and is the chairman of China Green Finance Committee to deliver the welcome remarks and keynote. Dr. Ma. Thank you very much, Chen Ling, and uh, it's my uh, honor to welcome you uh, once again to join this uh, discussion on capacity building hosted jointly by NDB and uh, IFS. Um, I heard a new saying a lot on the need for capacity building, and uh, let me elaborate a little bit on what exactly the capacities we need. 
for green finance and for transition finance. On the green finance side, uh, I've been working on this uh, for past 10 years initially within China, leading the drafting of the green finance policy when I was in Central Bank. And later on, I worked on a range of international initiatives, including co-chairing the G20's Small Finance Working Group, which produced uh, quite a few products that Neil was uh, mentioning. And uh, within the pure green space, which we typically refer to renewable energy, electric vehicles, batteries, and so on, uh, we can say that uh, we need knowledge and capacity in four major areas. Number one, a taxonomy, defining clearly what green activities are. With that taxonomy, uh, we can avoid a lot of confusion, avoid uh, green washing, and reduce the cost of identifying these activities. And uh, so far, I just checked uh, uh, you know, through my, my, my research team. They say there are 300 taxonomies in the world. And uh, initially, China started 10 years ago. We had a taxonomy. Now EU has taxonomy. Now between EU and China, we have common ground taxonomy. But still, it's proliferation. Um, every country trying to create a taxonomy, which is a problem. It's confusion. It's leading to market segmentation. and may end up with more greenwashing. So in that area, I think in countries that are not yet using taxonomy, we should help them building the right taxonomy with the right framework, the right building block, and referencing to the international best practices. The second piece is the disclosure. Um, I think initially, in the Chinese case, we were asking the issuer, the fundraisers, to disclose environmental information, which means that you claim your project is reducing air pollution, water pollution, tell me how much, right? How much SO2 NOx is being reduced? How much COD is being reduced? Now we need to ask the issuer to tell us how much you have reduced carbon. Um, so these are the information which is critical for mobilization of money for that project. But of course, we are moving towards a broader-based disclosure system, which is based on ISSB. ISSB is more complicated, asking all companies to disclose from governance, from strategy, uh, from transition plan, from stress testing, and many, many other things. Um, and in this regard, I do support globalization, harmonization of disclosure standards, but I highlight capacity building is the key especially for developing country emerging markets. You cannot ask a small company in developing country uh, to fill in this uh, huge form of ISSB where they feel most of the data and calculation methodology are not available. So somehow we need to make sure the disclosure requirements um, may be tailor-made for developing countries, SMEs, at the same time providing technology, such as digital technology, to lower the cost of filling all these forms. In fact, uh, you know, one of the tech companies here, I think they were telling me they can reduce the cost of being compliant with ISSB by 90%, just offering some tools uh, to the, uh, uh, these uh, small uh, stakeholders who want to be involved in green finance. The third aspect is the uh, um, financial products, which is really the job of financial institutions. They need to put out the green loans, green bonds, green ETF, green ABS, uh, green everything. And uh, uh, in each of these segments, there are a lot of knowledge available. But I think information asymmetry become a problem. Uh, a lot of knowledge somewhere you know, in the world, and maybe in the university, maybe in the consulting firm. It's very expensive to you know, uh, get this information. It's very expensive to find this information. And we have to do something, really, to make knowledge available uh, at a much, much lower cost, better at a zero cost for emerging markets developing countries. And uh, finally, it's really about governments and regulators which need to contribute policy incentives to make these green projects bankable. There are a lot of green projects, similar projects, impact projects, I can see you know, tens of thousands of 90% of them are not bankable, meaning they're not making money, uh, they cannot guarantee they can repay the loans, they can repay the interest that you know, principles. So how do we make some of the others bankable? That's the capacity of the government. The government has to come with some fiscal subsidy from some regulatory policy that make the markets grow and uh, uh, some help from giving them maybe cheaper and free land so they can install their solar and the wind facilities. All of these help need to be put together in order to make many of these projects bankable so that MDBs and private financing can find the right projects. So these are the four areas of capacity we need, um, uh, actually badly. Now moving on to transition finance, which is a relatively new concept. Uh, that's something G20 discussed extensively last year. Um, also the G20 came up with five pillars. And I think in each of these five pillars, we need capacity building. Number one, how to identify transition activities. 
which is different from the green taxonomy. And uh, in the transition space, we need a transition taxonomy. For example, Singapore, they have done this already. Uh, I was in the discussion, they showed that we have amber taxonomy, which is a list of activities that's not pure green, but it's moving towards green. Something like that is needed for many, many countries to lower the cost of identifying transition activity that's credible. And secondly, it's a disclosure requirement for transition, which is mainly about the transition plan for the company, for the fundraisers. I would say in 100 companies which wants to transit, 90% of them don't know how to do transition plan. They don't know how to do short-term, medium-term target, and, and even longer-term targets. They don't know how to do scope three carbon accounting, and they don't know, you know, do stress testing, all of these. And in that space, we need a lot of, lot of capacities. And also on um, products, that's a third pillar of the transition framework. Um, we have to use a lot of sustainably linked products, meaning the interest rates for the transition projects is linked to the performance of the transition, which means that if your decarbonization is faster, I'm going to give you lower interest rates. So how to structure these deals? It's a knowledge that needs to be transmitted to a larger part of the global community, especially in the finance sector. And uh, the fourth pillar in the G20 framework is, uh, uh, again, the, uh, the incentives to make uh, uh, these transition more financially viable. And one of the things which we need to uh, really do a lot of work is uh, the voluntary carbon markets. Um, because uh, voluntary carbon markets actually can provide additional revenue to projects that actually decarbonizes. So helping different countries to build a voluntary carbon market, connecting all these 20 something different markets together, using the same international standards, lower the cost of verification due diligence, is a massive area of capacity building that we need, which will then feed into the transition projects and making them more bankable. And uh, finally, it's about just transition. I think uh, you know, NDB and many other colleagues here, um, they constantly talk about that. In the transition process, how do we make sure we're not laying off too many people? And uh, in the G20 framework, we ask specifically the uh, finances and companies to take into account uh, the just element of transition. When you do a plan for transition, tell me, are you gonna lay off a lot of people? If you will, tell me, do you have a plan to mitigate that social impact, which is through, for example, retraining, reskilling program. If you do that, as a financer, I may actually reward you by offering a little bit of lower funding costs. And the governments should also reward them for doing that. So these are arrangements which I think need to be put in place. But again, the governments, the financial institutions, and the companies need to have the knowledge and capacity to do this arrangement and working together. So really against this goal, I think uh, we will be launching very soon. In fact, uh, Chen Ling said on the 5th of uh, December, also, in, during the COP, uh, my team will launch the Capacity Building Alliance of Sustainable Investment, which is called CASI, C-A-S-I for short. And uh, uh, so far, we have uh, 42 organizations joined as formal member of the CASI, and we're still expanding, and we're talking to NDB uh, for active participation going forward, um, which means that uh, we now have a platform of aggregate knowledge from all these 42 members, including uh, major banks, um, international organizations, uh, the big four accounting firms, the universities and NGOs and associations. So these knowledge will be aggregated through CASI and then distributed to the global emerging markets at a zero cost and uh, some at a very, very low cost compared with the commercially uh, available training materials and uh, uh, learning programs. I hope uh, through that scheme uh, we can help uh, on a large scale uh, enhance the capacity of the emerging market for sustainable finance. And our target is to actually reach out to 100,000 participants uh, through CASI by 2030. And I'm looking forward to your support and participation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ma. <clears throat> I think the more main um, areas or types of capacity that might be needed in the market to scale up green and transition finance is very clear. And it has been also expressed that during the past week, when we were in Jakarta to launch the GIP's Southeast Asia or ASEAN chapter um, with the local partners, most of them are also very interested in taxonomy. So in areas, developing areas like Southeast Asia and maybe in other parts of the world, including Central Asia, where AIGU will be moderating the next session, um, actually I think the need has been very clear. 
on disclosure, on products, and also on just transition, which is also a very important part of the G20 transition finance framework. So I think the four types of areas are the key, um, <clears throat> also contents that needs to be focused by many capacity building alliance or uh, platforms in the future. Um, <clears throat> and I also hope that it will be providing some guidance for our uh, panel discussion at a later stage today. So with that, um, actually uh, on our agenda, we also have Kamran Krahan, who is from uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, but he is tracked and actually outside in the uh, security check. I guess uh, let's give him the floor at a later stage today, if he can still make it. And without further ado, let's, I think, first entering our, um, the panel discussion to be moderated by Mr. Aigu Kusalieva, who is Director of Sustainable Development at the AIFC Authority, and uh, allow her to introduce her dear panelists on stage, because the panelists must take some time to wear the, uh, the mic. So everyone, please, um, Aigu, I'll give the floor to you to welcome your panelists. Yep. Let me try this. It works? OK, well. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And let me invite my panel to the stage. So we have with us today a um, brilliant lineup of speakers. So we have Nishant Arya, Vice Chairman of the GBM Group. Please join us on the stage. And we have Azreen Idao Zainal, who is a General Manager for Sustainability at Securities Commission of Malaysia. Please. Uh, we have also uh, Maher al Kabi, who is advisor to group chairman and independent board member at Acercal Group. And last but not least, we have uh, Anjali Visokmumonan, who is the director for policy at Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. Uh, dear panelists, thank you very much for joining us today. We're very pleased to have you with us. And I would like also to welcome the audience for joining us at the panel session where we'll be discussing the capacity building for low emission and resilient economies. So um, let me start from this, that um, in fact, the transition to low uh, emission development would require like major shift in the economic systems, in policies, in financial sector, and it would require innovative, let's say, approaches and technologies to make the transition happen. And the capacity building becomes in particular instrumental in this. And as just digital uh, skills are quite needed nowadays, the all different you know, jobs, let's say, from uh, procurement manager to fleet manager can be done in more sustainable way if the workforce have the needed skills. And I would like to provide you some data, you know, before we get to the discussion, so you have some understanding, you know, of the background of the issue. So according to the latest LinkedIn report on green skills, the uh, overall penetration of the green skills in the workforce is growing across all the sectors and across all the countries which we studied. So basically, what does it say that uh, there are uh, people who hold the green jobs or have at least one green skill, and the number is growing. But at the same time, uh, the study finds that the demand for this kind of workforce is much higher than the supply. And according to the LinkedIn uh, findings as well, the hiring rate for the people with the green skills is for 29% is higher than for the general workforce. So we can see here that there is a demand and market supply rule in place, right? And if we go deep in the industries, uh, there is understanding that uh, overall penetration of green skills across different sectors of economy is almost the same. So it stands around 12%. So what does it mean? It means that one out of eight people across all the industries have the green skills. Or let me put it that way, seven out of eight actually doesn't have any green skill to perform the way the job in more sustainable way. And if we look at the financial sector, so the industry actually is lagging behind from all the other sectors. So the uh, penetration in the financial sector is around 6.3%, which means that only one out of 15 have the green skills to perform the job, job the, uh, sustainably. So what does it mean? It means that uh, basically we don't have enough workforce which can perform the work in a more sustainable way. And actually the study which was done by Financial Centers for Sustainability Network, our friends from MC, uh, FC4S Network, also actually confirms this idea. So according to the assessment, the 50% of all the financial centers say that the lack of capacity is one of the most three challenging um, barriers for development of sustainable finance market. 
So it means that we need to equip the financial sector. We need to help the policymakers to drive this agenda. We need to provide them knowledge, resources, and tools to make this happen. And with that in mind, we gathered today the brilliant panel uh, with different, like, you know, various backgrounds to share the knowledge, to share the ideas, how we can actually transform the uh, sectors to make sure that our workforce have the skills needed to perform sustainably to make just transition happen. And to make this more effective, let me start from this. We'll have one general question to each of my panelists, and I would like to ask you to keep your answers uh, to four or five minutes if possible. So we'll have second round of questions, specific questions for each of you, and we'll have the Q&A session just uh, uh, which was mentioned by Cheng Lin, hopefully in the end. So uh, first, let me start actually from uh, Nishan, from you. So GBM Group is actually the conglomerate which is worth more than $2 billion. And you act in uh, various industries, including AI, and you are present in 37 countries across the world. So tell us, please, uh, where you're standing from. What kinds of capacity is needed, actually, to make sure that just transition happens? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, no, I think first of all, uh, I would like to uh, really congratulate uh, NDB for organizing such a session because it's at a very opportune time and at the right place we're discussing this. And uh, we at uh, JBM embrace uh, sustainability in every possible manner in all our different businesses. When we look at sustainability and where the industry and different countries are positioned today, I personally feel that it's extremely important to see that the basic fabric of skill is most important because on one hand, as you rightly mentioned, there's a dearth of people which are required. On the other hand, uh, we need s skill sets available. So we are actually focusing on a lot of learning, unlearning, relearning programs for equipping people with such skill sets which are specific uh, to green technologies, whether electric mobility, renewable energy, zero emission technologies, and uh, driven by digitization uh, to ensure that uh, everything is based on data analytics. Another thing uh, which is playing a very critical role here is that the evolving skill sets, not only new skill sets as we go along, and uh, when it is getting coupled with digitization, I think uh, in certain cases people talk about redundancy of manpower, but I feel that it is reigniting the kind of knowledge which we need uh, for these domains, and that's where the ecosystem approach comes in, and at an ecosystem level, if we are looking at the green and the zero emission ecosystems, uh, we are clearly able to see that starting from renewable energy, uh, going up to different forms of green mobility, and uh, infrastructure which is being used by the final user, I think is a very large part of the ecosystem which touches the common man. Almost 90% plus people would use such kind of resources. And the impact of such uh, changes is going to be very important. But for funding such kind of uh, projects, I think the green financing and funding is something which has enhanced substantially. But it's a long way to go for the industry to really see that in every country, every region, every project is getting priority over other projects in, when it, it's needing green funding and financing. And <clears throat> I think there's a huge opportunity which lies here where uh, multiple institutions, including uh, different organizations which are committing to this such kind of impact investing and green funding, are looking at uh, getting involved with such avenues across the world. So I think creating a right dashboard of such kind of opportunities and such great institutions uh, which are working on such projects across the world, getting them together would be a very good opportunity for collaboration and co-creation in this space. Uh, because I personally feel uh, that at the end of it, it is all about technology driving value. And if we are able to categorically understand technology driving value uh, with collaboration across different regions, then uh, we would be able to crack the puzzle of uh, really understanding the green impact of with green financing and the green skills, as you rightly mentioned. And I think that would be the ultimate success which we would look forward to and being a part of that ecosystem to really contribute and see that how are we able to put our uh, portion and point across clearly and understanding that it is not a one-time exercise. I think the long-term goal for the next 25 to 30 years, even 50 to 60 years, we are able to clearly see how things are happening on the ground and how we are able to categorically 
understand the nuances because it's not a cookie cutter model. Every country, every region, every project requires different kind of enablers. And I think those enablers can only come across with the right uh, collaboration and co-creation going along. So, and with the fabric of digitization, I think uh, the global economies can really work together and the exchange of data information really equips each other to understand how real-time information can be used for decision making in all such cases. And uh, even remote locations can be manned and can be uh, used for addressing the issues which they are facing. And in many areas where the development is going on now and we are creating new development opportunities, so those development opportunities can be created with a totally green and zero emission based structure. And uh, I think having these different pillars in place would really redefine the cities and the urban infrastructure and the way we are implementing projects, inclusive growth, and uh, uh, coupled with a long-term strategy, I think would be delivering results in such cases. That is how I look at it. Thank you very much. I liked your point about the ecosystem approach and digital technologies. And it was mentioned earlier that digital approaches actually helps to drive the cost down, right? Correct. And that comes us, brings us actually to finance part. And in here, actually, I would like to turn to Azreen. So you were with the Securities Commission in Malaysia for nearly 10 years now, right? And you were involved in all the sustainable finance policies in the country and across the ASEAN market. So, and uh, please just correct me if I'm wrong, but you're staying in the intersection of finance and policy making, right? And from you, where you are standing, what do you think about the capacities we need, you know, for making the just transition? First of all, thanks for inviting me for this session. Uh, in relation to uh, your question, I think in terms of capacity building is really important. Uh, but before I go further to explain about why this is important, uh, I just wanted to quickly share a little bit about the work that we are doing in Malaysia. Um, so for Securities Commission Malaysia, we've been championing Sustainable Responsible Investment, or um, SRI. Sorry, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, better? All right, thanks. Okay, so um, before I go on to answer your question on capacity building, I just wanted to quickly share on the work that we've been doing uh, in relation to championing sustainable and responsible investment in Malaysia as well as in the region. So for Securities Commission Malaysia, our work on SRI are guided by uh, five strategies. The first one is in terms of widening the range of SRI instruments. The second one is building a more diversified issuer base. Third is attracting more investors. Fourth is building an internal governance structure. And fourth one, uh, the fifth one is in relation to enhancing the information architecture surrounding the, the, the ecosystem of sustainable and responsible investment. So across all the five strategies, capacity building, is critical. So we have in the past and continuously uh, embark on various capacity building programs that covers across the five strategies, working with various uh, partners um, in delivering these programs. Uh, in relation to transition, what is key is that the understanding of new technologies. You mentioned earlier about technologies and data. So this is where the financial sector, they really need to understand the technologies, especially the new ones. Um, as we know, the financial sector are very familiar with the traditional sectors. We know services, manufacturing, infrastructure. We know how to structure financial products in order to finance uh, those industries. But in relation to new technologies, um, there are a lot of things that the financial sector may, know not, may not know yet. So this is where unfamiliarity may breed contempt. We don't know it, then we shy away from it. If we know it, then we are able to better price the risk and then structure the right financial product for those uh, new technologies and new sectors that are emerging. So just to share a little bit, um, back in 2015, 2016, Securities Commission Malaysia was tasked to uh, lead, we were tasked to lead uh, an industry working group reporting directly to the Minister of Environment back then, looking at, uh, the, the task force is called Green Finance Task Force, so we were looking at how we can further mobilize uh, finance uh, to finance green projects in Malaysia. So at that point in time, 
um, renewable energy was a new sector in Malaysia. A lot of us didn't understand what is renewable energy, um, how does a uh, solar farm work, what sort of financing is needed to finance renewable energy. So through this task force, uh, it kind of um, group people together, those from the renewable energy sector, the policy makers, the regulators, uh, the people who are working on the projects, connect them all with the financial sector. So together then we discuss on what is needed to mobilize finance for renewable energy. And since then there's been a lot of programs that we've done uh, towards this. And this has led to the issuance of the world's first green suku in Malaysia for the financing of a solar project. And uh, that was the beginning. Uh, but now, the financial sector is familiar already with renewable energy. They know how to structure a suku or a bond to finance renewable energy. And the issuances of uh, green suku in Malaysia in relation to renewable energy projects are now around 20% uh, of total issuances in the market. Uh, the other issues make up of um, affordable housing, sustainable agriculture, and other projects. So while, while RE has become more familiar to us, uh, but there are other new technologies that are emerging. For example, hydrogen, uh, CCUS, just to name a few. So these are new. This is an area that uh, a lot of the financial sectors, we might not know a lot of these things yet. So this is an area that we will continue to engage with the relevant uh, industry players in Malaysia to enhance the understanding of these new technologies and from there to look at what are the ways to structure the right financial products uh, to finance these things. Um, earlier I mentioned about the issuance of the green uh, suku, the world's first green suku in Malaysia. So just to highlight a bit that um, prior to the issuance, uh, the particular company, they had a tough time uh, in approaching the banks to get financing. They know about, you know, the only source of financing they know was to get a bank loan. But they had a tough time securing a bank loan because the bank didn't understand how uh, to provide loan to renewable energy projects, what sorts of rate to be charged, how to do the due diligence, the risk assessment. So that was a challenge then. And it was uh, quite fortunate at that time that Securities Commission Malaysia and the World Bank Group, we just established a working group uh, that looks into outreach and awareness program, particularly among the renewable energy producers, and how to get them to understand about the bond and suku market in Malaysia and what sorts of financing uh, that they can avail themselves uh, through issuing bonds and suku in Malaysia. So through continuous engagement with this particular issuer, we then uh, managed to educate them about what are the processes of issuing a green suku, what needs to be done, connect them with the bankers, connect them with the external reviewers, and from there, you know, they, they learned how to do it and they tap into the green suku market in Malaysia. And learning from that, uh, we have launched our flagship program. We call it Navigate Green Financing Program. Um, this program is outreach and engagement with businesses to tap into the Malaysian capital market to finance their green and sustainable projects. Um, we have reached out to almost 700 businesses since we launched the program and this is a program that we will continue doing uh, even next year as well. Please. Thank you very much for your answer, actually. You know, it brings me my memories. When we started in Astana in Kazakhstan, like in 2016, working on green finance market, we've been doing the same, you know, actually educating the market, you know, to tap, to get the, you know, to fund the projects and actually to start to understand what is green, right? And uh, before you get like to the funding. And you also mentioned Islamic finance, and I'm very happy to actually to turn to our next speaker who has extensive experience in uh, Islamic finance, in board membership, in risk management, like in a lot of sectors. And uh, I'm sure you have a lot to share with us, uh, Maher, about your views, you know, about the capacities needed for just transition. Please, floor is yours. Uh, 
Excuse my both hands. Thank you very question. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for inviting me over here as well. I believe the two keynotes, I mean, you've given as well, kind of encompasses everything we talk about capacity building. I'll talk from, economy, from the overall economy perspective in UAE and what we do. I put in an acronym called HITS. H-I-T-S, and there is an F after that. But those who are exercised probably understand what HITS stands for, which is high intensity interval training, but I disappoint you, it's not that what I mean over here. So starting with human capacity building, which is very important, I think echoing back to all what you guys have mentioned is tremendous. Now we live in an environment, particularly in UAE, where you have about 160, 200, 200 nationalities. So they bring about their own cultures and values. So that makes it even more challenging for you to align their thoughts together when it comes to green economy and environment preservation and so forth. So we're building and working on that. Now, before I dwell into these things and building te technical abilities, we keep on talking at our level, which is the adults, which is fa fantastically and fine. But very few of us actually going back to education system and teaching the next generation because this challenge is here to stay. I think it's going to be a longer time. So how do we go back to education system? And I happen to sit as a chairman of board of schools where we have about 60,000 children locally, internationally, and we're actually inculcating program in coordination with the Ministry of Economy. So one of the things Ministry of Economy has done, they've ran a pilot program. They're running a pilot program as we speak a couple of months ago where they'll train their trainers, about two to 3,000 teachers on their circular economy and environmental preservation. Post that, they will make sure the program is on all the public schools and they will make it as part of the curriculum. We started ahead of that in my schools, given that I'm trying to guide them and tell them this is something very important to do. It's one of the five things that we need to do. If we take a macro picture, globally there are two major trends going on in the world. One is the digital economy, second is the circular economy. And the first will actually fuel the development of the green economy and the circular economy, without which it's not gonna happen. So we're talking about AI, digital twins, Web3, just name it, metaverse as well. And we personally working in our companies, which I'll do a little on, how we're developing our own AI model for the circular economy that we have and digital twin and so forth for the factors we have. So starting with the edge, which is human development. How do we make sure we're trying to make alignment, people understand it, and building the technical abilities for people. So that's what the government is trying to do. Going to the I, which is all the in institutional capacity building that we need to do, which is your public sectors, which is the government, and public sectors. Now again, we live in UAE economy and we've got a beautiful problem where actually government is leading the way and public is trailing back. If you go to the rest of the world, it's usually the, public, it's the private sector leads the way and the government actually follows. We have a reverse over here. So you've got every single company in, in the government is trying to establish an, a framework for that. So uh, through a ministerial decree last cabinet, to 2022, we established something called Circular Economy Council, which I happen to sit as well over there, which is making sure that we collaborate with all the government sectors, along with the private sectors, when we come up with the policies related to the circular economy, green economy. So we're working about on 22 policies, all the policies that we're working on, we're not drafting them. We're bringing this, uh, the private subject matter expert and that particular things that we want to recycle, for example, and through a workshop, they develop the policies. So what happens now, because they're driving the policies, the, when it comes to implementation, it's about 80% easy for it to be done when we roll the policies out. And we've witnessed when we rolled out the five policies, the adoption and execution has been a larger, strong impact in the, to the environment because they drafted the policy. Because the objective of the government was not to break the company, but work with the companies. So within the council, we have government bodies. It's led by Her Excellency, uh, Maryam al Mehri, she's the Minister of, of Climate Change and Environment, also led by Minister of Economy, Abdullah bin Tog, and also other ministerial representative and other government bodies that we have today, and private sector. And of course, the other important pillar is academia, because we want the research to be there on a constant basis, which we can feed us for us and make sure what we need to do next. This is when it comes to institutional capacity building, which is the H and the I. T is the technical, which is another challenging thing that I believe in my humble opinion is not being done given importance in a sense of that we have a lot of KPIs globally would happen, and I think one of you mentioned is how do, we how do we make sure that this is applicable to me in the country? So we see all these greenhouse gas emission KPIs that we see in the world, which is fantastically done. A lot of people researched it. However, is it applicable to my region? 
is it applicable to my environment? So we need to make sure that we also come up with our own assessment, recheck these uh, technical KPIs that we have today, and also keep on building on them. Because as the environmental change ha changes happen, we need to make sure these yards tech need to be adjusted automatically. And what will help that? Data. Data is the actually going to fuel any technology development. You don't have data. You don't structure it, you don't cube it, you don't put it in a proper way, you will not be able to move forward. I've been working with for data and AI for the last 40 years, since our child was programming, so I know the importance of data and how we were managing trillions of data in the previous organization I was in. The S and the hits is the societal impact, which has also been alluded to by yourself. If we do not take care of the vulnerable societies and communities, this is not going to happen. We have to make sure we take care of them. And they're an immense example of what we're trying to do in the UAE. But I think we are less impacted from that perspective. We're talking about those countries who are impacted when natural disasters happen, when jobs mobilize, demobilization happen. So luckily, in the first day itself, the, there was a donation of $260 million has been already put in place for those disaster recovery things, but now it's already crossed for $60 million. I know it's a, a drop in the ocean for it's what's required, but I think over a period of time, this is gonna increase. So this concludes all the hits. These are the core things. If we know and remember and work on them, it will happen. Now the F, which I did not mention, and all of you have talked about it, which is finance. Now. Again, finance, you need to make sure that you have the right mi mindset of doing it. So what are we trying to do? I've recommended something in the council that we need to go back and collaborate with Central Bank so we can put a certain percentages of funding need to be done on the going basis. It should be to the green economy and provide all the incentives required vis-a-vis -vis whatever we have already discussed in the past as well. So these actually will be the key things that we need to do and we're working on. Last but not the least, as we speak, we're trying to develop a circular economy lab which we're going to be launching beginning of the next year, where we further enhance the development of circular economy, bring in more participants from the private sector, how do they can collaborate, and they, they develop the policies for the transition from the linear economy to the circular economy. Thank you very much. <laughs> you made so many points out there, so I, I just like maybe point one collaboration between the academia, government, and the, pub, uh, the private sector. I like that one a lot, and uh, where you built. Build on Living over here and around the world and regionally as well, and this is the message you will see our forefathers and the current presidents is always echoing and actually executing with collaboration. Without it, nothing yeah, going to happen. Yeah. That's true. And the last you said finance, so that's why I want to turn to my last but not least speaker. So uh, we have Anjali, who is representing the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. So basically, it's a collaboration of institutional investors, right, in 11 Asian markets, and uh, it's focused on climate impact finance. So the funds under the uh, group, under the management of the group, is over 32 billion US dollars. Please bring your perspective, what capacities we need. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so as, um, as Madri Dale sort of mentioned, I work with the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. It's, it's an initiative to bring um, climate-related concerns before the financial community. So we work with over 70 in, in institutional investors, so including both asset owners and asset managers that operate in Asia. And we're looking at both um, international and domestic investors, and they manage over 32 trillion USD in assets. So one of the fundamental things that we sort of do with our members that are investors is, is capacity building, right? Um, and I think the difference in the way that we sort of approach this, I think a lot of, a lot of what I wanted to cover has been covered by Dr. Marjun and all of our panelists. I think all of these points are really important. Um, I just maybe will highlight some of the gaps in maybe what was discussed so far. So I think climate as a topic is very challenging. It cannot be looked at with a single lens or even a double lens. There are so many different problems that are associated with climate and so many different factors that you need to sort of consider. So one of the ways that we approach um, capacity building for the financial institutions on climate is to look at it both in terms of themes and markets. So I think climate, you can sort of look at it in terms of emissions, but there are also other concerns like nature, the impact on people. Um, when you look at, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, okay. So when you look at things like transition, the impact that it has on jobs and the economy is also a matter that investors need to sort of be considerate about. So just last year at COP27, there was a, 
a high level expert group report on net zero targets by non state entities that was put out by by this commission and i think that report is really useful to sort of help um, different institutions that have set sort of net zero targets or any sort of targets related to climate to really think about what they need to do and especially when you sort of look at that chapter on just transition there's there's it is quite incumbent on like you know at any institution that's engaging in a market to understand the market nuances within which climate related aspects operate before you sort of mandate what needs to happen in that market so there is a lot of capacity that needs to be built on the issues of climate like i mentioned but then also in terms of how that applies to different markets i think fundamentally when you look at how climate has sort of evolved in terms of conversations it's been sort of examined from different markets but when you look at broadly asia you're sort of looking at what are the asian related concerns regarding transition and you know how do you sort of develop frameworks around that so i think there needs to be a fundamental shift in sort of looking at some of these issues from a more market level perspective which is what we're trying to do um i think the issue of transparency and credibility especially in the finance sector is something that's become you know much more incumbent and there's a lot that needs to be done to build the sort of credibility so there are a lot of you know service providers there are you know rating agencies that are trying to sort of make this process easier but again how does the issue of transparency and credibility come in like regulators are stepping in to actually regulate how you know rating agencies are operating and what sort of metrics they are using to sort of assess how companies are progressing and how that will affect the finance sector as well but i think as you know you realize how complicated these conversations are around climate investors are sort of stepping up to develop their own tools to do their own assessments of what needs to happen in these different markets and the only way that these conversations i think can progress is like many of my panelists my co-panelists and all of the welcome remarks also sort of mentioned is through more collaboration the only way that you're sort of going to be able to understand markets enough to form a credible strategy that will guide your investments is through more collaboration through more understanding and working together to identify what pathways are required for different markets and how do you do it and how do you sort of bring in finance at different stages um so at ai gcc one of the fundamental things that we do is to sort of adopt these different approaches on understanding the different themes that will sort of flow into the climate conversation but also how does it apply to different markets so we do quite a bit of work across different markets in asia such as um a lot of the asean countries japan china korea um and we're keen to sort of do more and collaborate more as you know these conversations progress thank you very much for your insights i think we're running out of time so i will just do this maybe i'll ask you one question each but i would like to ask you to keep to two minutes your answers yeah can we do that so great uh, first one uh, nishant is to you so you're coming from private sector and the thing is uh, we want to understand anyway what real action private sector can do right to like you know build the capacity and this want you to bring the example you know on the way to this pavilion this morning i stopped at the green pavilion and i was happy to see the you know the boost for posco company so it's a steel making company of korea and i uh, was lucky enough 10 years ago to do my degree in korea and my studies was funded by this company actually and today i see that they are not only in steel making they are on the in the hydrogen business so they are growing in all that so we can see kind of the collaboration right of the private sector with the you know public and in fact the private sector is in need in that workforce right because you will be using this workforce to make the change happen so you need the people skilled people so can you just put in 2 minutes like what activities can be done by the private sector you know to make the you know capacity build so you have that workforce in place see uh, what is essential is that uh, the main driving force i would look at is is competitiveness for driving competitiveness you look at scale and size and when you have the right scale and sizes that's when you need the skill sets in and large number of people to really support that growth so whilst we look at this so uh, different initiatives can be taken by the private sector where the private sector is investing in technology and technology is enabling people for developing multiple skill sets multi skilling of people parallelly and whilst doing so they are getting open markets to really scale up and uh, enhance the growth because i always feel that uh, sustainability leads to scalability and if we are able to ensure and see that sustainability is profitable then 
private sector and public private partnerships can really be the way to proceed further and as we transform and that's where different initiatives as you mentioned hydrogen so green fuels because green fuels whether it's hydrogen or it's electric backed by renewable energy amongst many others along with biofuels and circular economy also lead to energy security for different countries so when we look at energy security that also gives an opportunity for different countries to use their foreign exchange in deploying into different technologies and areas supporting the private sector doing public private partnerships and growing businesses and that's what we uh, at JBM also always try and see is that how in each business we can make it scalable, how are we across uh, deploying solutions across the globe, and how we are uh, having an approach of think global, act local. So every single region and country is getting those solutions, and we are able to see that technology, skill, scale, size, clubbed with the whole uh, local solution is giving and leading to competitiveness and that competitiveness is giving an edge to the local economies really drive growth and move ahead as we go along with a lot of collaboration and focus on green funding and green funding being easily available and at scale and sizes I think what would drive uh, tremendous uh, movement in this direction where multiple countries like India and many other countries would be at the forefront of such opportunities to collaborate with the global economies. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Azrin, a uh, question to you then. So there are like a lot of efforts, right, done to make sure that we have necessary finance to, you know, uh, make the transition happen, but still we're short of climate finance. So from your point of view, what capacities do we need to build uh, to make sure that we have the climate finance? You mentioned several programs you're running in Malaysia in the region, but what is next? So what, what, sh what should be done? Um, first of all, I think we need to realize and understand that for transition, it's not one size fits all. Um, while at the country level, we might have uh, national policies on transition, but at each industrial sector, at each company level, transition plan is unique. Uh, Malaysia, for example, we just released our energy transition roadmap just a couple of months ago. And in order to realize the transition pathway to 2050, we need uh, billions of, of dollars um, to realize this ambition. Um, but that at the macro level. But when it comes down to the company level, this is where each company, they will need to look into what needs to happen for them to transition. And for them to realize that, for them to really understand and, and set their transition pathway, they need the right set of data. And this is important uh, because once they have the right set of data, then they're able to identify, um, to monitor as well as to track their progress towards their transition pathway. Uh, this is where we are actively working with our relevant partners um, to teach companies, where the PLCs as well as the SMEs, on how to start measuring their GSG emission, how to do so, what sorts of tools that they need in order for them to do so. And second uh, part is in terms of the need for comparable and consistent sustainability information. I think uh, Dr. Majun mentioned about the ISSB. This is an area that we are looking at in the uh, in Malaysia. So we just. Um, uh, establish a task force that looks into the implementation of ISSB standards in Malaysia as well as the readiness of the preparers and the assurance providers. So the importance of having comparable and, and, and consistent accessibility data is also important so that from there with this data set that we have in terms of JG emission, data sets on in terms of the accessibility information. So all this will be important so that the financial sector can then structure the right uh, finance uh, products uh, in order for companies to meet their transition goals. The other point I wanted to mention is about um 
the need for greater mobilization of blended finance. So while there are some projects that uh, are considered as low-hanging fruit, uh, as they can get private financing quite easily, um, RE for example, uh, especially those proven technologies, they're able to tap into the capital market. Uh, but with regards to new technologies, this is an area where we need uh, we need blended financing the most. Uh, the participation of MDBs, the International Finance Corporation, for example, this would be helpful in terms of coming at uh, a stage where the project needs at risk capital, where the projects are not yet ready to be commercialized. Uh, funding in the forms of grants, for example, this would be really helpful for some of these projects. Um, this is an area that we are actively facilitating as well. Just a a couple of months ago, we had a, a roundtable with the IFC, uh, comprising with uh, Malaysian stakeholders such as the policymakers from the energy sectors, the financial sector players, as well as the energy sector players, looking at uh, what can be done in terms of financing energy transition in Malaysia. What sort of financial mechanism is needed, as well as exploring uh, blended finance uh, to finance Malaysia's energy transition. Uh, moving forward, we will continue. Uh, to engage with the relevant parties uh, to explore this topic further and from there to also identify uh, if there's any uh, pilot projects that we can work on together uh, in order to mobilize climate finance. Thanks. Thank you very much for your insights. And uh, Maher, one question to you here. So you are in diversified business and uh, so from the standpoint of hard to abate sectors, what do you think, how to make sure that we have that right mindset in those sectors of economy. My, in my case, I'm coming from the country which is heavily relies on fossil fuels. So we have a lot of companies out there which are still not realizing, let's say, where we're standing right now. And I'm sure UAE has, um, might have similar experience, right? So how to make sure that those companies understand that, have that mindset, and they start acting? So sure. What do you think? Given the two minutes uh, target you have given, so I'll try to be very, very fast. First of all, the government, as I mentioned earlier, leading the way, whereby all the oil companies, for example, Adnok is one of the large oil companies today producing oil, but it's the only oil company which is the entire operation is from renewable energy. Nobody knows that. That's a fact. So that means they're leading the project, leading the way. Second, they, again, Adnok, they actually launched their second uh, carbon capture project just in September, two months ago. And this is one of the largest carbon capture globally. There are three companies which do carbon capture, one in Switzerland, one in Canada, one in the US in Dallas, and we're the fourth number one, which is on the largest care. So that's another thing the, world, the government is doing. It. So it, on the contrary, despite being a fossil oil company, we're actually government, we're moving very, very fast. Mazda City that uh, probably some of you heard about, it's, the, it's been there for about 16 years. They've got about 40 existing projects in renewable energies globally, right? They've actually taught me a bit of geography, which I, I thought I knew very well because I used to draw the world map. They've actually invested in a few islands in the Pacific Ocean. I've never heard about them. That tells you the reach of Mazda City, how they have been collaborating with other governments. The reason has been the opening, the, the, the inauguration of the largest floating solar panel in Indonesia just this month. Uh, where the CEO of Mazda was there and our minister, uh, His Excellency, Dr. Thani Ziyudi was also present over there. So UAE is leading, leading the way from there. When it comes to company level, what we're trying to do is again uh, raising awareness because we are diverse in nationalities, mimic the nationality that we have in the UAE. And it's what I keep on saying to the people, look, your knowledge is your treasure. Practice is the key to the treasure. So you need to practice, keep on saying it, because transitioning to the green economy is not going to be a switch on such a button. You have to actually keep on chanting about it till people get bored. I'm, I sit on the camp where I don't think the planet will explode by 2050 if we don't reduce 1.5. Yeah? I believe we need to get, that doesn't mean we need to be complacent or lethargic. That means we still need to work. We need to make sure that we do the right thing to make it happen and touch it very fast. As a company at the Sarkal Group, We've actually got one full vertical couple of businesses just in the renewable energy and circular economy. So one of, the, one of the companies that we have for the past 14, 15 years, where we take certain waste from the food establishment, the fat and oil in Greece, 
we actually put it back into the economy in terms of water for irrigation, brown oils for cosmetics. So you ladies, if you're getting your cosmetic coming from that, that's, this is the most healthy one, I can assure you. There's no chemical into it, or we use it for soap manufacturing. Or the hard stuff which comes out from that waste, we actually convert into fertilizer, so back to the economy. One of the other plants which we're going to be opening this month is how do we take a feedstock of used cooking oil, being used by a lot of people, and actually convert into biofuel? Well, which can blend it and be, can it be used as B40, B100, whatever you want to do. So as a company, this is already ingrained in our DNA. As a country, it's already coming from our faith that we need to take care of the environment, period. So there isn't, there isn't any political agenda from that perspective. So it's all about continuous talking to your people, putting up the framework, learning what people are doing as best practices, and then cut it to what you think is important for you in this environment. How can you make the change happen? So when people are leading this change in the company, it's easier for it to be implemented and then information dissemination and implementation happens very quickly. Thank you. You made it in four minutes, not two. <laughs> <laughs> but let me turn to Anjali. Just one uh, last question before we wrap up. So still we believe that finance is quite important for the agenda. And um, we know that the, that's the you know, scale we need to work at. And the one question to you is about climate risk management. What kind of tools should be out there you know, to make things happen? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the tools that we've developed for investors is like, you know, once investors have made commitments to sort of act on climate, we've created an investor climate action plan that sort of tells investors what you need to do once you've made that commitment to sort of act on climate. And so there are five pillars of, you know, activity that investors need to prioritize when, when you know, you start acting on climate. First is alignment of investment. Um, I mean, I could sort of go into that, but I don't think I have the time, but I will just sort of cover the main pillars. So investment is, I think, quite obvious. You have to sort of look at where your future investment goes and also sort of evaluate your current investment, see which sort of trajectory it is in line with. You're, you need to uh, look at your engagement. You need to look at your existing portfolio of companies and engage with them to understand what plans are at their level. So we sort of help uh, with some of these engagement programs, such as Climate Action 100 Plus, utilities engagement to sort of help investors understand company level performance better. Um, I think policy advocacy is very important for investors to do because I think in a lot of cases where investors are asking for a higher level of ambition in a lot of markets, if it doesn't align with what the policy is able to provide, there is going to be a mismatch in returns. And that will affect investors' sort of objectives, right? So there needs to be some level of policy advocacy to ensure that investors are able to perform. We're also asking for more governance. I think this is one of the hardest pillars that you know investors are really battling. I think at a senior management level, you need to be able to be held accountable for what you're committing to and, and where does that accountability go back to and how are you enforcing it. And this needs to translate across the organization. And I think all of this requires a lot of work. Um, some of these things like disclosure, governance, uh, investment, they will all benefit from more um, capacity building being done at the company level, but then also at the regulator level to really understand what investors need to be able to perform in that market, to be able to understand companies better. So I think that it is really a whole ecosystem shift that is required in terms of capacity building. There are plenty of useful frameworks that's out there to sort of help understand what each player is trying to do. But I think really right now it's time to move. I think this conversation on capacity building is, is the most important one, I think, overall that's sort of like happening. I think everyone really needs to understand what the different players need to be able to move faster, because I think that's, that's the real issue, right? We need to be able to move fast, and the only way we're able to move fast is to understand what everyone else needs and you know, bring everyone into the movement together. So I think this conversation was, was really great and was really interesting to sort of hear everyone's um, efforts on this, yeah on something very, very important uh, she's mentioned, and I've not mentioned it. I was in the panel discussion last week in Central Bank. Uh, apart from all the five pillars that we talked about, accountability and taking people into task are very, very critical. If you don't do that, trust me, you're green hushing and green washing, and God knows what green things will come up in the future going to explode. So if you don't hold people accountable and take them to task, this is not going to stop. Thank you for bringing that. That's the brilliant end of our session. Thank you very much. I think you got like a lot of insights. I would just like not spend time, you know, on collecting all of them, but we understand the collaboration, we understand the digital approach, we understand the data's importance, a lot of a lot of things. And uh, we hope still have time after the session, you know, to have some chats. And for now, I'd like to thank all my panelists and uh, excuse me for being sometimes bad policy guy, you know, but uh, I was instructed by Cheng Lin, we need to keep the time, you know, we still have speakers to join the, you know, this, uh, the stage.
stage here. So thank you very much. And please, uh, Cheng Lin, floor is thank yours. You. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Aigu, uh, for your very excellent moderation and also the very excellent um, points made by our distinguished guests and panelists. Um, so actually, we will be slightly late for a few minutes as we started late, about 10, uh, 15 minutes. So without further ado, I think we heard a lot about, uh, um, especially what uh, um, <clears throat> the panelists said, we need to mobilize each of the different types of stakeholders and players and make sure they actually are making the right actions. And we heard about the regulators, we heard about the association, and also real sector. And now let's welcome Mr. Um, Kamram, who is the head of ESG for Asia Pacific from, uh, from Deutsche Bank, who, used, uh, who is supposed to be speaking in the earlier um, <clears throat> uh, session, but actually due to the very long security line. Now let's welcome him to deliver his speech, uh, Mr. Kamram. First of all, uh, thank you for the invite, uh, New Development Bank and IFS. Um, it's a great conversation. I think a lot of the detail topics that have been talked about uh, are all very relevant. I want to focus on a few things that yeah, might be sort of on the edge a little bit. But I think these COP meetings, I come to every one of them, and I hear the same talking points. And I think we just need to start to distinguish. So when we talk about capacity building, particularly in emerging markets, it is very important to have an emerging market perspective on what sustainability should look like on the ground. This is not a copy and paste. So countries like UAE, like China, India, Brazil, it is very important for them to have their own process of thinking through what makes sense and how to adjust the global standards. Uh, I, I think a lot of that is happening, but it probably needs to happen a lot more. So I, I really thank Majun and a lot of the uh, other colleagues for their leadership in trying to create momentum with this distinction. The second thing that is, I think, important is when we talk about emerging economies, it's not talked about enough that you cannot address the climate challenge and let go of the development needs of the country. So there is an economic growth challenge which hasn't gone away for these developing countries. They still have people who need to get jobs. They still have young people who need to have futures. So this is not an either or. We have to find a formula that manages both of those things. I was just earlier this morning meeting uh, with another very large Asian country on the JETP program, the Just Energy Transition program with the government and so on. And we were talking about, look, this is not about one project or 10 projects. This is about the transition of an entire economy. And you cannot just look at it simply by looking at emission numbers. You have to look at how you bring the intensity down overall in the economy and so on. So I think the, the construct, the formula for sustainability in developing countries is actually going to be quite different. And when I walk around here, I feel like people use the same talking points regardless of which country you're talking about. You cannot have the same conversation in Europe about sustainability as you're having in Asia. It's just not logical. But I don't see enough of that distinction being made. And this is why setting up a capacity building group for emerging economies under the leadership of uh, economies like China, for example, that is the biggest green finance market in the world, depending upon who, you know, either one or number two, right? That's a very good setup as it is for trade, as it would be for uh, a number of other things. It should be for sustainability. The, a lot of the emerging economies can borrow from what has already been done over, what, 10, 15 years at least. Um, it still needs refinement, but I think we need a different playbook here 
than what is constantly discussed as if every country is the same. Now, when we come to developing countries, the other significant thing that is not talked about is that when you're talking about developing countries, you're talking largely about you know, small micro enterprises. That's what emerging economy uh, you know, is made up of, mostly. And the discussions we hear a lot in these kinds of meetings, uh, including at WEF, are more about, more relevant for multinational corporations. So when we think about capacity building, what we're really talking about is creating consolidated, scaled platform that small companies can utilize without running into you know, unmanageable transaction cost. To become sustainable for a small micro enterprise is a massive challenge. It's not about telling them what they need to do and who they need to hire and what, how to measure uh, emissions. It's also about providing a platform for the country where each small company can go and take advantage, advantage of that. For, let me give you an example. A, and, you know, in this digital world, we have actually figured this out in many other aspects. So if you look at a small company and you look at how they do payroll, right, how they pay their employees, it's very unlikely that they'd, they would have two, three payroll specialists sitting inside the company. They've usually outsourced that to a third party that does it for thousands of companies and has the system in place. There's no reason why environmental sustainability data cannot be outsourced like that. The measurement, monitoring, reporting, and it'll also be digital, it'll be also standardized. So when we talk about emerging economies and sustainability, that's what we should be really talking about. We can't talk about the big, huge, you know, pie in the sky concepts that really don't go anywhere beyond just the uh, talking point. And then uh, last bit, we talked a lot about, about financing. Again, when you come to, uh, look, I do like, I don't even know how many billions of dollars of sustainable financing in a month, sometimes in a week. Most of it is for multinational corporations. But what I'm telling you is that when you try to do financing for sustainability in an emerging economy, it is not business as usual. It requires innovation. It requires institutional change. It requires different risk-taking uh, appetite. And it requires very different structuring. So also not transferable. It is going to be very customized and unique for these kinds of economies. And we, we just need to start talking about these things and working on them instead of just assuming that whatever else is happening around the world would somehow solve the problem in emerging markets, because I don't see it happening. Um, and, and I see that a lot of emerging markets could find themselves left behind, particularly when it comes to international trade. So you will start to see very quickly barriers coming up around the world where people say, well, we will not import anything that is not certified sustainable. And if an emerging economy doesn't have the wherewithal, the capacity to actually produce things that meet those definitions, they're going to be in trouble. And then we will have a whole another generation of haves and have nots in terms of global economy. We can't let that happen again. It already happened with economic growth over the last several decades. We cannot let that happen with respect to sustainable growth in the years to come. So anyway, thank you very much. I hope this is useful.
Thank you very much, Mr. Cameron, for your very impressive uh, key, uh, well, uh, note as a speech as well. I'm very impressed by your <clears throat> uh, words about not copy and paste, uh, either the solutions or the capacity building itself. And the, the points I think we heard in many cases are very identical, uh, are similar, uh, sometimes identical. That's exactly what we need to do. So <clears throat> um, the last speaker we have actually is Mr. Nolan, um, Stephen Nolan, who is the managing director and head of the secretariat of the FC4S. Um, of UNDP. I think they are working on capacity in talent development as well, where I think I will also refer to some of the numbers they have. So they are just, I think, launched or are going to launch a new report on that. I very much look forward to that. So, Mr. Stephen, the floor is yours. Now, good morning, Dr. Ma. Um, I remember a few years ago the Irish Deputy Ambassador in New York had to give a speech to the New York, pension, New York Police Department Pension Fund. And as he was stepping up to make his remarks, the policeman said to him, you're between us and our dinner, and we all carry guns. And so I'm the last speaker. I don't want to get in the way. I know he's very, got a very busy day. Uh, so if I may, just very quickly, and as, as I came in there late, because on a different panel, and it was very interesting to hear your remarks, sir, just around that, what I call the interoperability issue. Capital is global. We have different taxonomies. I'm showing my age now, but I was a former Irish government advisor on the mobile technology space. And you remember your mobile phone battery would last for a week. Uh, all it was is calling and SMSing. And the most sophisticated game was Tetris. Um, but if you went on holiday, say from Ireland where I was, to France, the roaming charges would nearly be the same price as your holiday. And so we were able to get over on top of that. And now we're all in Dubai here, and it's seamless. Uh, international connectivity, and that's again going back to capital and sustainability, and that there should be no barriers around that interoperability. And then the second thing, again, based in Ireland, but as a European, the European economy is based on SMEs. It's the lifeblood, as are most regions. And if we can't bank, if we can't finance SMEs, if we can't build their capacity to disclose, well, where regulation is going right now, we will be closing them off to finance in years to come. And imagine. We're seeing the rise of far right across the world right now. Imagine that as a cause. You're not supporting SMEs, elitism, climate, and we don't need to see that. My third point, if I may, and just at a, at a, for a moment at the risk of embarrassing him, it's always great to be in the company of Dr. Majun. Uh, I think it's fair to say he's the godfather of green finance, before most of us were, were talking about it. And I was just on a previous panel, and we were talking about the different policy and regulatory actions that have happened in the last few years. The NGFS, look how fast and how big it's grown. The FSB, what they're doing, transition finance, IOSCO, uh, the sustainable insurance form that I oversee, the international platform for sustainable finance, and then of course the G20 task for transition finance framework, you as the previous co-chair of the G20 sustainable finance working group. So it's great to be here with you as well, sir, just uh, discussing this topic. From a UNDP perspective, 41 financial centres, we go live with this report tomorrow. It does kind of identify some of the existing challenges or the challenges that still exist. To your point, they haven't changed that much in the last few years, but we are getting better at them. Obviously, data quality and availability, development of standards and guidelines, people are calling for this. Policy and regulatory conversions at a global level. We're now not just around the environment or climate, it's about biodiversity, it's about just, and will we see a conversions around those different topics in the next few years? Pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. I'm thrilled you're doing billions a week. Uh, in other jurisdictions, people are struggling to find pipeline to actually invest in this area. Innovation, a very much abused word, but the innovation of new products and services. I mentioned the word biodiversity earlier on, but the key one again is talent development or a lack of. There is a war for talent going on right now in the whole area of sustainable finance, and it's not just in the market. It's at policy, regulatory, and market level. And so as I close the session today, I must congratulate Shen Lin and the colleagues uh, about the new initiative, CASI, which goes light later on this week. I was with Mayor Bloomberg earlier on this week, and they've just launched a new global capacity building coalition, which is great to see. And then we as UNDP, providing the secretary to the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, we also are providing the secretary to the new TAP, uh, technical assistance uh, uh, advisory platform, and then we obviously have Dr. Majun's initiative. So again, what's going to be key there is the interoperability between those different initiatives as well, because we do have limited resources, we do have limited bandwidth, and we need to make sure that those resources hit well. So Dr. Majun, as always, congratulations. Thank you for bringing us here again today. You're the, you're the ultimate convener, uh, and I'm uh, so forgive me for missing the, the earlier elements of the panel, but I think we also need to compliment the UAE government 
It's quite a show that's been put on as you walk in here. The hospitality is fantastic, but most importantly, the substance is key. Uh, and so thank you very much for including me today, and thank you for including the UNDP. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. So that's our last speaker, but actually the voice on capacity building does not stop. And it's not uh, just uh, in the COP. As um, uh, Stephen just said, uh, on December the 5th afternoon in the AIB pavilion, actually very close, a one minute walk in the AIB pavilion from 1 to 2 p.m., we're gonna formally launch our CASI, Capacity Building Alliance for LV Investment, uh, of Sustainable Investment. So feel free to join us for that launch event, and also seats are reserved, actually we have limited seats. So those uh, who can come earlier can get it earlier. Thank you once again very much for joining us today, and wish you a very good stay here. Thank you very much.